Welcome uh, to this uh, very special edition of uh, Chat with Chair. Uh, we are indeed privileged to have uh, Mr. Vishwa Prasad Alwa, Founder and Managing Director of Scandray Technologies. For those of you who may not have followed, but Scandray was really instrumental in the ventilator self-sufficiency in during the first round of the pandemic. Of course, uh, he is a medical technologies entrepreneur, uh, and uh, he is, of course, respected as a med tech and electronics uh, technology expert. He advises, uh, you know, government and a lot of industry uh, members as well. Uh, he has a huge uh, professional experience, including uh, the head of technology integration in GE Healthcare in the US. He also served uh, in GE in Bangalore. And uh, he was also involved with Kiloska Electric uh, Motors in, 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 the, in the field of r and I think his company is among the fastest uh, growing and largest Indian uh, medtech R&D and manufacturing company. He's of course uh, received many awards for four consecutive years, uh, awarded the highest export award by Piki MSME and government of Karnataka. So welcome, uh, Mr. Alba, uh, to this chat with Chair. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the, for, for the invite. Let, let me begin with a very uh, generic uh, question just to uh, you know, set the ball rolling. You know, in the second wave, uh, you know, uh, industry, your company, other people have taken uh, many steps to help in augmenting medical supplies uh, during the second wave. Could you share with us uh, some uh, steps that you have taken as a company, what you were, others have done and what you're thinking of? Yeah, I, I'll uh, start with the short uh, introduction. No, the difference between the first wave and the second wave. When the first wave uh, struck, it was the Niti of the Ministry of uh, Health, the Ministry of Commerce, uh, uh, the Defense Ministry that came together and started looking at technology gaps and supply chain gaps uh, or as you know, for the country as a whole. So the uh, level of activity and speed that was there, empowerment and uh, decision making was very quick. So what uh, Scandra and many other companies achieved in the Indian market, uh, along with public sectors like Bharat Electronics and DRDO, was phenomenal. In, third, in uh, less than eight weeks. We delivered uh, 30,000 ventilators, manufactured them at Bell, got support from DRDO for supply chain and software validation. And uh, that was one very uh, uh, quick response to the pandemic. But uh, later on, you know, uh, there were a lot of uh, um, questions on the government, why it was centralized. And I found that the government was slowly decentralizing it to the states. Uh, asking the states to be ready and then, uh, you know, funding them. And that is where we missed. So if you ask what we have done for the second wave, uh, it came totally, uh, you know, like, like just like the first wave without any um, preparation. And what we are doing for the second wave is as uh, slightly worse than the first wave because there is no centralizing agency which is giving direction, placing orders. Uh, in the first wave, we had uh, very clear orders from the government and in the second wave, uh, co uh, the companies are looking at uh, requirements from various sources and uh, most of the state governments do not have funds, they are depending on CSR funds. On the industry side, of course, the first wave put some kind of uh, alertness in the company and uh, capacities are, are quite high. And uh, Indian companies have um, have built uh, core technologies, not I can't say core technologies, but manufacturing ramp up to be able to deliver uh, machines. Now, liquidity was a problem in the first uh, wave uh, to ramp up. The risk taking abilities of MSMEs are very small. So nobody has kept stocks in anticipation of the second wave. Thank you for that uh, description between the first and second waves and how we actually work. Uh, I understand that you are actually you know, in discussions to ramp up uh, or start and ramp up uh, oxygenator, uh, you know, uh, oxygen concentrator uh, capacity. You know, in that context, I'd like to first actually understand 
you know, uh, the requirement, why is there a requirement of oxygen concentrators? And second, what are we planning to do and what, uh, you know, uh, could we achieve in the next few months if things go well? Yeah, see, the oxygen, the, the focus on oxygen concentrators came because there was a sudden flow into the hospitals with mild cases, which, uh, which would really get into the ICU and critical cases. Um, oxygen supply, uh, it is not that the production is lower, but logistics, uh, you know, put a challenge. And uh, in, in a very idealistic situation, see, uh, prior to this pandemic in 2020 March, the entire installed base of ventilators was 14,000 or 11,000 ventilators and about six or seven in semi-working condition. And the number of intensivists that could intubate, that could intubate and wean a patient out of a critical uh, you know, ICU ventilator was in the range of 11,000 to 15,000. Now, uh, in the second wave, the, the demand on the load on the hospitals is extremely high. And uh, people are coming at a very, very late stage to the hospital where they need oxygenated beds. If people are uh, treated uh, on time, just with the onset of the symptoms, 99% of the people would not need to come to the hospital. But uh, the, the, uh, the mechanism and the infrastructure that we have uh, has not been able to screen people and treat them at early stage. So we have the hospitals overloaded, both private sector and uh, public sector hospitals. The other difference that we see is um, uh, with the, with the, uh, in the first wave and between March 2020 and uh, you know, March 2021, we have not added much capacity of, uh, of doctors, uh, intensivists, uh, respiratory uh, technicians, and uh, paramedical staff because when the uh, when the pandemic was waning uh, it, it didn't look like the, the second wave is going to be serious so there was in the private sector of course nobody will buy equipment and keep uh, anticipating the uh, second wave in the public sector hospital since it was not centralized decentralized to the states and states had uh, uh, you know each state had its own uh, way of tackling the problem uh, we have landed in a situation where we have not, uh, we are not prepared with that kind of uh, infrastructure to take. And uh, for your kind information, in the last 70 years of independence, we have covered only 20% of the population with uh, healthcare infrastructure. So expecting the government to build the infrastructure, you know, within one year to cover maybe 20 lakh patients uh, is uh, from 11,000 to 15,000 patients in ICU is something that, uh, you know, uh, it is humanly impossible. Uh, there are slips, there are loss, uh, you know, a little bit lacks uh, uh, focus on, uh, on healthcare, but this situation could have been avoided if we had uh, anticipated the uh, second wave sometime in September, October itself, and then prepared for ICU beds in the public sector. Private sectors of will, will never buy equipments in large numbers and uh, look for return on investments. Oxygen, uh, um, uh, the need is coming because we have not prepared. Otherwise, oxygen concentrator was absolutely not necessary. Now, if you want to decongest the hospitals from mild cases, oxygen concentrators with uh, pulse oximeter and uh, the uh, prescribed medicines as per the protocol of All India Institute of Medical Science is the best combination to do at home. And that is where this uh, noise about oxygen concentrator is coming. Coming to the oxygen concentrator, it is not a very complicated product. Uh, ICU ventilator is very complex, uh, but an oxygen concentrator is easy to make. It has got some electronics, valves, control systems, and uh, then compressors and zeolite material, which will enrich the oxygen. Now, uh, compressors and uh, electronics and fluidics is something that the country is already having the capacity. Zeolite is, is not available and it is in short supply. Uh, and now, Bharat Electronics and BPL are working on, on an option to uh, ramp up the oxygen concentrator 
production in the country. There is a lot of imports coming, and uh, BPL has been making in uh, smaller volumes in the past. Uh, Scanray, along with ECIL, is trying to augment the supplies of BEL and BPL once they have saturated their capacity. Um, and to be uh, to uh, to give a summary of that. Oxygen concentrator is needed because of the lack of preparedness of the public system, healthcare system, which again is uh, uh, is uh, is due to multiple uh, factors. In China, for example, they have a huge uh, population of uh, concentrators, and they used it effectively. So you believe that uh, you know uh, till we ramp up the healthcare facilities and we have more ICU beds and more oxygen, which will take a few years. You can't ramp up. I think you said eleven thousand. Uh, you know you, you have to take that up to much more. But uh, I think uh, if you if you see uh, that uh, concentrators are required now. You know very just just uh, you know, the RBI has announced. Uh, a uh, new funding mechanism you know a 50000 crore uh, liquidity fund for uh, healthcare sector what do you think uh, you know uh, it would be the impact of this sector and will it help uh, people ramp up production because it covers not only hospitals but also talks about uh, equipment manufacturers logistics suppliers so what is your view on this 50000 crore fund See, we have to look at uh, look at it sector wise. Even in the medtech sector, there are multinationals. That is, uh, you know, GE, Siemens, Philips, who are you know billions of dollars who do not depend on the Indian banking system either to scale or for working capital. Then there are uh, mid-sized companies uh, that are you know in the range of 100 crores to 500 crores in the medtech sector, and many of them are predominantly traders importing from China and distributing in the country. And then there are small, very small medtech companies that are in, in you know, 10 to 25 crores of uh, working capital. Uh, now, uh, this 50,000 crores that the government has uh, announced as, as liquidity for the healthcare sector can ease a little bit of the working capital requirements of these companies. Uh, it will not result in any strategic investment decisions because that is based on long-term fundamentals of the Indian medtech and healthcare distribution system. Unless you see Aishman Bharat reaching out to the rural areas, unless we see PHCs upgraded to uh, high-tech hospitals, uh, we will not see activity of uh, uh, long-term investments in the country. For working capital, yes, the banks were very, very slow in releasing. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in spite of uh, you know the... Uh, the top uh, person, the cabinet secretary uh, intervening with SBI, it took uh, more than uh, a month of discussion to get working capital limit in the first wave of the pandemic. Those kind of situations might be released, but how many companies are there who are eligible to take this? In the medtech sector, in pharma, yes, it will, but you also have to see the risk appetite of a company. This is not grant, it is loan. So if you are going to take a loan from the from the from the bank, uh, if it is going into term loan or building the capacity, they will look at long term. For the market, we have to see what we can do deliver in that six months or one one year's time. So it's a welcome move, but I do not really look at it uh, really stirring something long term in the com in the country. I think the long term uh, solution has to be found in the national infrastructure. Uh, pipeline and the healthcare projects there. I think that that uh, is another discussion. I don't really want to go into it uh, at this yes. point of time. But I would like to get your literally um, uh, your views. I know you talked about the BPL, uh, BBL, and the ECIL and Scanray thing. Uh, what would actually make it happen? You know, you said that the Niti Aayog and other people last time really focused on enabling you to make ventilators, and now that you're in install uh, you know, exporting ventilators but to make this happen what are the two or three things that need to be done to enable that uh, to happen very very quickly yeah uh, quick clarification Dilip. we were exporting ventilators prior to the pandemic the government never bought from us but when the import stopped uh, because of shortage 
uh, the government started recognizing Indian companies and seeing that we make. But anyway, we uh, you know the the whole success of the of the uh, of delivering those ventilators came because. Uh, there was a nodal agency, there was Niti Aayog, there was the ministries who were sitting almost every day. And uh, then there were confirmed orders placed on Bharat Electronics. So Bharat Electronics could really buy the materials and uh, DRDO was pulled in. But in the second wave, we do not see that uh, kind of an activity happening. The government is telling us to build uh, oxygen concentrators for the country. But uh, there, is, uh, there is no visibility of who is going to buy that. See if the if the pandemic you know wanes off in the next few months and there is sufficient Chinese imports by that time, it is a big risk on the smaller companies. MSMEs cannot take that kind of risk. Public sectors, ECIL and uh, BEL, uh, um, are also not willing to invest unless there is a confirmed order. And as of now, no single government agency is asking neither BEL or to ECIL that they would back such a production. So it is still in discussion stage last six, uh, I think three to four weeks, this discussion is going on. Whereas in the first wave of the pandemic, it was in three to four days that we could get everything going. And uh, we had the entire central government machinery behind this project. We see this lacking in this, uh, in this particular uh, project now. And, and uh, if they discuss for another two weeks, the whole project will become irrelevant and unviable. I think from, from, from your perspective, the two things uh, are, uh, one is uh, aggregation of orders uh, so that you see some visibility at least for the next two to three months. And yes. then once that happens, you know, the investment actually takes care of itself and then you, you can do that. And second is, uh, of course, you know, the government uh, helping out with uh, uh, things like... Yes, yes. Now, very, very, very clearly, there are two points. Yeah, very clearly there are two points. One is irrevocable orders on uh, BEL. And the second one is the same kind of uh, mechanism that the government put in the first wave by uh, helping these industries to get uh, some of the critical raw materials. I think here in this case, it is only zeolite. There was also the issue of compressors. Has that been solved? The compressor... See, compressor, you can work around. There are a lot of manufacturers and uh, Kirloskar Oil Engines Pune had developed a compressor for ScanRay uh, during the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, they were all qualified, technically superior and uh, safe to use, but the price was about 6,000 rupees more than uh, uh, you know, our current buying price. So uh, maybe a little bit of... Uh, uh, playing with the uh, with the margins, uh, it is still a very good option, and I don't think that that will be a roadblock. Okay, so you know, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, in your estimation, right? Uh, what is the capacity that states uh, should look at and plan for? Uh, you know, uh, supposing there is a next wave. You know, we heard the principal scientific advisor saying that there may be a third wave. Yes. So, and earlier on, you had actually said that uh, October, November last year, we should have planned for this wave. So, yes. supporting, you know, what are the steps that we could take to plan for the next wave in terms of medical equipment and facilities and, you know, all of that? See, uh, medical equipment and facilities, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, private sector and public sector hospitals, the action plan is very different. Um, in, in the government sector or the public health system, the most important thing is to make sure that people are uh, treated at home for mild and, uh, 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 you know, initial cases. And there should be a way to bring only people who need oxygenated bed and um, uh, care from the doctors to the hospital. That will remove 90% of the loads on the hospital. Today, you find people flocking uh, because they come very late. Uh, the, uh, uh, this will help much more than adding equipment. And adding equipment is, is not just a pandemic response for the private hospitals and for the government sector. It is also viability. If you are going to spend, let us say, uh, 25 lakhs to 30 lakhs per bed, per uh, ICU bed, 
and uh, then uh, you are you have to recover that within a certain period of time private hospitals would really think uh, a lot to take care of this the other most important thing is uh, start uh, retraining doctors of other modalities like uh, dermatologists general physicians uh, cardiologists to uh, you know be at least standby doctors to take care of the pandemic in critical cases 11000 now it has gone to 20000 intensivists is just not sufficient we cannot create intensivists in that short time we can redeploy the medical uh, skills that are available and government and the private sector should start running uh, uh, crash courses to convert the other doctors into inter, you know makeshift intensivists for the next pandemic and uh, uh, in the medtech it is not necessary to have very complicated machines even uh, uh, you know having non invasive ventilators uh, in sufficient quantity will reduce the load on the icus and having uh, paramedics you know people who are uh, retired people who are um, you know uh, uh, not having jobs lot of gulf returned uh, uh, nurses are available in different parts of the country bring them back into the uh, into the system train them thoroughly so this is the best preparation that we can do apart from adding uh, uh, technology and uh, uh, infrastructure no if i recall correctly you had offered to i think was it the chatisgarh government to train their interventionists uh, and train other staff nurses and even i think general duty assistants uh, to uh, to you know help in this so do you have the facility to do that can it be done is it a, is it a tele facility or it has to be a physical facility yes we see uh, the uh, scanray and the mahindra um, offered a, a, a iot ventilator to the government during the first wave as we delivered units from bharat electronics mahindra and mahindra and scanray also submitted another iot base but uh, here the government was saying that it is not as per the spec the response to adopting to new technology was not up to the mark um and during the first wave we there were a lot of groups that were formed to train paramedics now uh, this time uh, even chatisgarh i don't want to blame the government because the situation is really out of control and anybody in that position uh, you know they have a limitation but uh, they have not been able to put all the paramedics for a training program because they are all overwhelmed overwork they come at 6 o'clock leave at 1 they are not willing to attend more training programs and they are just looking for for being alive or to keep people alive for the day so it is not a time even though we are you know we give lots of ideas suggestions comments to the government i understand that this is not the time to push certain things so we have to what we can do is uh, as a as a company we can treat people in our neighborhood take care of them educate them make sure that they get the right medicines and reduce the burden on the hospitals but these are all preparations for the next wave so well, you know even in this pandemic times you are still running your factory because it's an yes. essential service we just share with viewers what are the covid appropriate precautions and behaviors you are taking in your factory which they could also adopt to keep the factories running yeah again i'm uh, comparing between the first in the first wave we had zero absenteeism uh, we we uh, just ensured mask social distancing sanitizing we were sanitizing the factories we were tracking the family members of all the employees we are about 700 people in two plants in mysore about 100 in italy italy uh, unit was a uh, little bit impacted for a few days but, but they were still up and running in the second wave uh, we are hit uh, with uh, at least uh, 20% of the of the workforce um uh, you know uh, uh, hit by the pandemic and um, uh, uh, all the measures that we took last time did not work very effectively now but what we found is people who have not traveled outside people who have not attended marriages uh, festivals and not been roaming in the market have never got Uh, impacted and if we are able to screen people early we can keep the workplace safe so fundamentally your message is that uh, to companies one uh, of course uh, 
follow uh, social distancing, enforce wearing masks and sanitize, uh, sanitizing of hands, etc., as well as sanitizing the workplace. Second is communicate with your member, with your workforce, that please don't go out into crowded spaces, even if it's a wedding or a party or a marketplace, uh, stay away uh, because that will keep you away from uh, the uh, disease and you can be much more uh, productive. Third thing that uh, you missed is uh, tracking the family members of the employees. So there were smaller groups that were trying to find out if any relative or any of our employees have some symptoms in their home. We are not looking at uh, being positive, but even mild symptoms, you know, we used to isolate. So that helped in the first place. Yeah, okay. So if, 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 you know, just to recapitulate one that, you know, following COVID uh, appropriate behavior in the plant that is wearing a mask, in, ensuring social distancing, and uh, of course, ensuring that people wash their hands, sanitize, and also sanitizing the plant. The second uh, most important uh, message that you gave is that the workers and yes, their yes. families should not actually go out uh, into crowded places, should not go out and, uh, and uh, participate in weddings and festivals and other things, uh, stay at home, keep themselves isolated and you know be safe. And more importantly, from a company viewpoint, it is not important only to track the employee, but it is important to track the family of the employee to see if there are, any, if there are no COVID cases in the family, because if there are COVID cases in the family, it's most likely that the worker may be, be asymptomatic and be COVID positive. So expand the tracking and testing to the family members and also their, uh, you know, their uh, the circle and of course you are promoting everybody gets vaccinated you have been advocating that all the medical equipment uh, workers be treated as frontline workers and yes. health workers and get vaccinated so yes. thank you very much for your time uh, mr alva and we wish you all the very best and look forward to seeing the first set of oxygen concentrators from your uh, ecl tire uh, soon thank, thank you. you thank you so much thank you